today's speaker is um, Jeremy Darach, who is the um, Chief Executive Officer in, of Sky uh, PLC. Sorry, the Group Chief Executive, Jeremy, is not your title, in Sky PLC. He's been with Sky PLC since 2007, um, sorry, 2004. He joined as Chief Financial Officer and then became CEO in 2007. Um, before that, he has extensive experience in, in retailing and in fast mover consumer goods sectors. So he was Group Finance Director of DSG International PSC, which was formerly Dixon's Group. And prior to that, he spent 12 years at the global company Procter & Gamble in a variety of roles in, in the UK and, and Europe. Now, in line with um, our focus on, on business, we like to think about not just the, the job that somebody's currently doing, but all sort of the, the other things that are involved in. So Jeremy is actually an ambassador of the World uh, Wildlife Foundation, and he was previously a non-executive director and chairman of the audit committee of Marks & Spencer Group PLC. Uh, he's a council member for the National Centre for Universities and Business and a trustee of Youth Sport Trust. So an extremely um, interesting uh, person as well as I say, a true um, industry leader. So Jeremy, thank you so much um, for your time today. I'm gonna to hand straight over to you and hopefully we will have time um, if any of our, our colleagues have questions for you. So thank you and over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And look, good, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, lovely to be uh, here. I was very pleased to be asked to uh, speak to you today, obviously in somewhat uh, unusual circumstances, but of course, at an especially important time for business for all of us, uh, and an uncertain time where one of the kind of the normal regular playbooks that we have at business uh, really have been, been out the window for any of us doing business over the last six months, and I suspect for uh, a good few months uh, ahead of us. Uh, as you heard, I, I spent over 35 years now in, in corporate life, so I wanted to take this time to uh, imagine my younger self sitting metaphorically uh, across the screen with you uh, today. And I've thought really quite hard about some of the bigger things, the most important things that I wish I'd known uh, at the outset of my career. And I, I thought I'd share some of those uh, today. And I do so in the hope that they can be helpful to you uh, and shine some light as you continue on your own, your own journey. The overarching thought I wanted to talk about is what it takes to build a sustainable and durable business. And I wanted to talk about that as a practitioner rather than a uh, theorist, one that is able to be successful in, uh, or at least weather all conditions, not just favorable, favorable ones. Or as a friend of mine often puts it, anyone can run downhill. Uh, it's running uphill into a wind that really sorts everybody out. I think if you look into uh, any business, you'll find that it's hard, a combination of what's and how's. The what's of a business are usually reasonably easy to figure out, that what markets we're in, what products we sell, what uh, segments we serve, uh, and the like. And of course, they're extremely important to get right. But the hows of a business, how we seek to drive performance, how we see the world, how we value our brand and our people, are often less immediately uh, obvious, but they are the heart, I think, of how all businesses differentiate themselves and deliver performance, value, and impact over the longer term. So I've been leading Sky for quite some time now, and I often reflect on how few of my conversations with any really of our stakeholders are about these hows and why they underpin our long-term sustainability and health as a business. How we're seeking, for example, to build our brand and our organization to develop a business uh, that lasts. My personal experience is that these sorts of topics don't get the amount of airtime they really deserve. And I think one of the reasons uh, for that, and I'm sure you've probably heard much about this, is so much of the narrative of business today remains uh, about immediacy of results, uh, and that we risk, I think, losing sight of the value of some of the key drivers of longevity and sustainability relative, of course, to short-term performance and short-term growth. Yeah, of course, in times like these, never has a brand been more important. Never have we relied so much on our colleagues to be able to deal with uncertainty and change. And never have we been more reminded about how important successful, sustainable businesses are to support thriving communities in which we all want to live and to prosper. So today I'd like to talk about and give you my perspective on three things. 
that I've come to view as fundamental to building long-term success. And at the heart, these are all about people, culture, and values. The first conversation I wanted to have with you is about the importance of adaptability and renewal, not just as an approach to doing business, but as a real imperative for long-term long success, an objective in itself, if you like, how to build a business that has the ability to adapt deeply ingrained in its DNA. Because I think that it's a recurring characteristic of businesses that stay the course and win in the long term. Then I want to come on and talk about the importance of mindset. Why I think that to build a business that's sustainable, you have to have the right mindset and an appetite, a, a true appetite for the long term. And how optimism, positivity about the future you're building as well as resilience and the ability to bounce back from setbacks and course correct after unexpected twists and turns are really key ingredients to success. And actually how they increase your chances of success as well. And then finally, I'd like to give you some thoughts on what a brand should mean. Not a theoretical view of a brand, but a, again, a practitioner's view of what's important and why from somebody who's been in and around branded businesses for a long time now. So let's talk about adaptability and renewal first. You know, building a business that's able to adapt in all weathers means that we need to be constantly reimagining the business for the future and embracing renewal. And a world where change, transparency and disruption have never been easier, it's more important now, I think, than ever. So the media and communications industry that I'm involved in has changed really out of all recognition in the last decade and it's going to change even more in the next one. Similarly, Sky. Back in 2007, when I was appointed, Sky was essentially a broadcast TV company. We were known then for sport, movies, uh, and news. Netflix was still sending out DVDs through the mail. Uh, Amazon had only just launched the Kindle. And the darkest cloud, really, that was looming on the horizon was an economic one that was going to be brought about by a self-inflicted banking crisis. We just entered the communications market. Uh, Sky Originals, that's our own created content business, had barely started. We were just taking our first steps away from reliance on sport and thinking about going further afield. At the time, we were criticised for not owning much, although it's interesting now uh, how so many large companies today are increasingly adopting this approach. In fact, we were, we remain today, one of the first or the original over-the-top companies. Uh, we've never owned the satellites that we broadcast over and much of the infrastructure that we use. Though we now produce a huge amount of our own catalogue, we don't have a large back uh, book of content that we can use to anchor our en endeavours to. In fact, we rent still today most of our content that we show. And so as a consequence, we aren't particularly tethered to any one thing. Now, at times, that approach can feel uh, quite uncomfortable, but I've come to understand it as a strength rather than as a vulnerability. Sky is a business at its heart. It's just a platform. It's underpinned by a brand and an organization. And we build a terrific brand that's incredibly valuable and trusted. It's epitomized by Believe in Better as a promise to our customers and a rallying cry to our people. And we've got a terrific organisation. Internally, our people seem forever restless and in a state of constant self-imposed adaptation. Uh, they reinvent and renew in the knowledge that what we're successful and famous for today can go away very, very quickly. So our goal as a business is to stay ahead of everybody else in what we want to do and what we want to be so we can step into the future and we can change faster than others can. And speed, of course, is now becoming more and more important than ever and an increasingly important dimension of competition. Now, a lot of the time, uh, our approach is not particularly comfortable. It can feel relentless, which is not for everybody. It's often uncertain. But there's a sense of possibility that's also exhilarating and exciting. You know, I often think of Sky as a, as a boat in the water, it's got unlimited possibilities ahead of it. Its wake is quickly disappearing, uh, and the signs of all the wrong turns uh, are rapidly not visible anymore. 
The boat's free to go wherever it wants, wherever it chooses. But always aware that uh, no, calm waters could appear choppy at any time. And of course, that's why this idea of adaptability and renewal are so important and central to our success. I tend to think of it as a corporate application of Darwinian theory. So whilst Darwin didn't coin the term survival of the fittest, he used it as a way of describing a theory of natural selection to make it sound less like some sort of divine choice. And he makes clear that by fittest, he doesn't mean the strongest, but the most adaptive. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, not the most intelligent that survives. It is the one most adaptable to change. I'm convinced that the willingness and ability to adapt, to let go at speed of what was successful in the past in order to make room for what will be successful next is a decisive factor in any business. And it's a key pillar of long-term sustainable and competitive businesses. And so I think the winners from COVID, uh, certainly among same sector competitors, will to a critical degree be decided by their relative ability to adapt to a changed and challenging environment. But importantly, not just for the immediacy of the crisis, but to set a course for a future stronger business. I've been struck over the years how many companies and how many of our competitors uh, are quite resistant to adaptation, holding on to old ways of doing things rather than stepping into the new ways. Certainly owning the wrong stuff is one obstacle that prevents you from renewing quickly. How many retailers, for example, have stayed attached to the idea of a large physical store presence until it goes from being an asset to a noose around their neck? But there are other obstacles to adaptability as well. Businesses, I think, uh, talk very little about the capacity and their capacity for renewal. So today, if you took a look at a typical risk register of an enterprise, no doubt you'd see lots of extraneous external threats plotted out. I guess you'd rarely see, though, the innate ability of the organization concerned, concerned to adapt and to renew itself featured very large, let alone analyzed as a material factor. And that seems a glare, glaring omission to me if we accept that adaptability is the key to survival. So I would argue that rather than only focus on specific risks and figure out how to manage them, the best way to protect and promote your business is to build an organization that's got adaptability as a core competence. It's better able to respond to any threat and opportunity, not just the ones its leaders declare most pressing or are most visible. Of course, if the experience of the last six months has taught us anything, it is that you never know what's around the corner, or to coin a phrase, the unknown unknowns. And in a world that will, I think, continue to become more connected, where a business environment will continue to get more complex and fast moving, of course, the forces that shape it are becoming less linear. And so the ability to adapt, to put change and renewal at the heart of your business, I think is going to become ever more important. Now, that's easy to say, of course, awful lot harder to do. So I'll give you four things to think about. First, think about constant reinvention and renewal as a basic function uh, of your business at any point in time. But think of it as an objective in itself, as opposed to just being a means to an end. Second, when you're in a position of authority, think about how you enable and encourage reinvention and renewal of the business as your primary function, rather than dictating the specifics. So at Sky, I'll give a clear direction of travel and a framework to operate in, but I'm really not prescriptive about what renewal means. That needs to happen in the operation closer to the ground. You really need the experts closest to the work to decide what renewal looks like in their area. As a leader, your job is different. It's to create the fertile ground and direction to ensure adaptability is hardwired throughout the organization. Third, know what the culture is your most powerful tool in making constant reinvention and renewal a basic function of your business. 
And then finally, understand that a species only adapts when its genes mutate in a way that's advantageous and replicable. So if as a company is a species, then it's people and the way they behave or its DNA, the genetic en engine of adaptation. And nothing is more addictive to human beings than familiarity. Comfort in the past and the present really retards our ability to seize opportunities to adapt and progress when they come. That's because we all know rationally that the past eventually runs out and gets replaced, but it's hard to give up on things, especially things we enjoy, that we're good at, that have made us successful and respected and are part of our muscle memory. And of course, much of that gets reflected in resource allocation with not enough money and critically people being allocated to building the future relative to managing the past. So put adaptability at both a personal and corporate level at the heart of what you do. The right mindset is the second ingredient that I've learned defines successful businesses and their leaders. And I mean, not just any mindset, but a resilient, positive, optimistic mindset. I think it's been proven now that not only does the right mindset make us happier, but positivity and happiness also increase our chances of success. You know, so much of business can be consumed by critical thinking, usually focusing on identifying problems and what's wrong, but sometimes we can lose sight of what's right. Well, optimists tend to see problems as temporary that relate to a specific situation rather than a general malaise that are usually externally rather than internally caused. Pessimists, unsurprisingly, see the opposite of these things. As a consequence, I've learned that optimistic people are better able to move through negative situations and challenges and sort of deal with the whirlywig of life and then see the upside in situations. So positive and optimistic people with the right mindset make others feel good about themselves and they can have a ripple effect that can extend through an entire organization because positive emotions are also contagious. A happy and positive workplace, therefore, gives an organization a greater chance of success. It creates a healthier place to work. The people who work in it are more motivated. They draw more meaning and purpose from, the, from what they do. And not surprisingly, then, positive emotions and optimistic outlook uh, on life boost our performance at work. It's really that simple, but it's also that important. The last few months of COVID have been the ultimate test, of course, in resilience. And of course, it's easy for all of us to get stuck in the short-term imperatives and problems and to feel somewhat overwhelmed uh, by events. If I look at our own operational resilience team at Sky, for years, uh, they've been running trial crisis scenarios. Now they've suddenly been thrust forward and center in running our command center for our COVID response. They've had to ensure that we keep our people safe, our business running day in, day out. And it's relentless work, standing up an organization to work from home over a weekend, keeping critical programming on air or ensuring the right safety protocols are adhered to. And yet they are some of the most resilient and optimistic people that you'll meet. Nothing seems to get them down. Now, maybe that's just because they understand better than anyone that stuff happens and we just need to work our way through it. But whatever the reason, they've proven to be brilliant role models in our business. The importance of these sort of wellsprings of resilience are really equally applicable to individuals confronting personal challenges as they are to organizations. So resilient people, I think, have got an ability to improvise and to bounce back from hardship. They face reality head on, They've usually got strongly held values. They know what matters, as well as how to make meaning from hardship rather than just to crumple in despair. Many times I've been struck that those who've really stepped up in this crisis have exhibited those characteristics. And the ones who've embodied resilience have had the broader shoulders and they've carried the greatest load. But almost always, they've combined that with an optimism and a positivity about the future. They haven't allowed their enthusiasm to get suppressed, and they've got strong beliefs that we'll get through this 
and it will pass. As a consequence, they're better able to keep things in context, to support their colleagues too, and they create this ripple effect of a can-do attitude around them. The third area I'd like to reflect on is understanding the importance of brand. Now, when we think about and read about brands, uh, we hear a lot about a brand being a mark of quality, a way of distinguishing yourself from competitors, a promise, a way of telling your customers what to expect from you. And that's true. It's all of those things. But when people talk about brands, they tend to think, I think, predominantly about consumer brands, specifically how that brand shows up, perhaps on a TV advert or a billboard. There's, of course, much, much more, as you know, to a brand than that, way beyond what the creative marketing teams do. To me, the key dimension of brand is the idea that it's an internal and external reflection of your business. What's inside the brand is also outside the brand. In other words, how employees see you, how your colleagues see you, and how you show up internally is a window to how you're showing up externally too. What customers employ seen experience should be exactly the same, and it probably is. So it's everybody's responsibility. Now at Sky, our internal mantra is to believe in better, always pushing to make things better for our customers, to innovate, to make our products better, which will make people's lives better. And that's why it's also the end line that we put on our advertising. But it's much more than a brand end line. It really runs through everything we do at Sky, like a red thread. It gives everybody in our business the right to say, this is okay, but we can make it better. And so it drives us every day. Now, the consumer and employee brand are therefore very, very important. And our corporate brand sits alongside them. How we show up externally as a company, what our narrative to the wider world is, that's about much, much more than just consumer or corporate PR. It's about choosing what you want to take a stand on, how you want to be perceived beyond your products and services, and what you want your people, whose opinions you care about, to say about your company when they're not in the room. Alongside these, I'd encourage you to think about one more aspect of brand that doesn't really get talked about, which is your personal brand. What do you want to stand for in the world? And how will people perceive you? Your own personal brand is probably the one thing that will follow you around from company to company. It's the same red thread that runs through your career. It needs to be authentic and consistent. It can be an incredibly positive thing in how you show up and what values you embody. But it can also be a hard thing to shrug off if you get it wrong. So when you think about the importance of the brand, yes, you should always look at it through the prism of business, the corporate consumer and employer brand. But you should also think about it, what your personal brand is, what you want to build and be known for internally and externally. I'd like to close today by touching on why these three ideas are important when seen together. And it's my view that they are important because they all contribute to a broader and bigger idea of business, which is the importance of business as a force for good. One of the things that all of us share in common is we've all chosen or choosing to pursue a business career. Indeed, you've taken it further. You've taken the time and you've invested in studying and learning more about the art and practice of business. So I think it's important to think about why we're all in this as opposed to pursuing some other form of career. And importantly, what footprint we want to make beyond our own chosen industry or job. Now, I believe in the power of business to have lasting societal impacts. And that an objective of every business, no matter how big or small, should go beyond the immediacy of what it does and what it delivers that a social mission is as important as a commercial mission. So 30 years ago, when Sky was created, we thought our commercial mission and our social mission were pretty much the same. That was to provide more choice to consumers. That in and of itself would be enough. 
to when we started. The news was at 6 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., or in your news agent the following day. You could watch the cricket, but you'd be constantly interrupted for horse racing. If you wanted to watch The Simpsons, well, you had to buy a thing called Betamax. Uh, we, along with others, changed a lot of that. Independent news is everywhere today. Millions of hours of sport is available. We have ever more an infinite choice. But as we grew and shifted from being an upstart to a scale player, we realised that our approach to responsibility had to grow too. Simply delivering our service to consumers uh, was not enough, not nearly enough. And as we became bigger, more capable and with more resources, the opportunity to use our voice became even greater. How we did things mattered too. That meant thinking about our operations, for example. We took a position on the environment because it was a major issue affecting our customers and colleagues, and they cared about it. So 13 years ago, we were the first media company to go carbon neutral. Then came Sky Rainforest Rescue, which helped protect a billion trees in the Amazon rainforest. And latterly, we've launched Sky Ocean Rescue. Now, through this latest initiative, Sky will have completely eliminated all single-use plastics out of our supply chain in just two years. So by the end of this year, nearly 1,000 tonnes of plastic will be removed from our business. That's the equivalent weight of seven blue whales. And this year, we've committed to becoming net carbon zero by 2030. That's fully 20 years before we legally have to do so. Why do we do this? Well, it is because simply we believe that building a greener and more sustainable economy has got to be the answer to this century's biggest question. And if we miss this opportunity, it will be gone for generations. So we have to do our bit. I think it's vital that every company, especially in our sector, recognises the need not just to focus on consumers, not to just renew its products and services, but also to think about its wider responsibilities and where it sits in communities, and then to act on that. The commitment to constant renewal, recognising that responsibility grows as we grow, living up to our brand promise, a belief that not just the what's, but the hows of a business matter too. These are the things that seem to me at the heart of what make a business successful in the long term. Sky, we try to embed these principles to drive our success. And I think if we continue to get it right, then our journey over the next 30 years, whatever that is, will be at least as rewarding for our customers, from our business, but also for the communities in which we live and thrive. I think that truly great businesses rewrite what their role in society is. The last six months has reminded us of the enormous importance of business, what we do to drive the economy and growth and how much we rely upon it to fund the national life and infrastructure we're all so dependent upon. And also how much we rely on businesses to look after people, especially young people like you who are just starting out. So as you think about your future career in business, the big thoughts I would leave you with are these. First, be adaptable and open to change and new possibilities. Always seek to renew, constantly work on building tomorrow's company and tomorrow's you. Second, carry with you an optimistic mindset. Regardless of how long the road ahead is, it's far better to live it optimistically. You'll feel happier, and you know what? You'll increase, increase your chances of success in doing so. Thirdly, remember brand, the personal and corporate brand, as well as the consumer brand. Brands attach to people as well as businesses, and they leave lasting impressions. It can either be a headwind or a tailwind, driving you forward or something you have to overcome. Think about it and work on it. And then finally, remember that these things are only important if you use them as an opportunity to build not just a bigger business, but a better business, a business that acts in a way that sees a bigger picture, that takes society forward in meaningful and practical ways. And if you do all that, 
you'll increase your chances of contributing to and building not just good businesses, but great businesses, businesses that are built for the ages. And we all need more of those. So thank you very much for listening.